Kia ora katou, no mai haere mai. Greetings to you all and welcome to this EHF live session with fellow Salmon, Rob Reed, John Lee as panel members and Chris Kanya as moderator. Today's topic is AI. What impact is generative AI likely to have on New Zealanders? We're not heavily digitized, so we may have missed the boat, but was that boat the Titanic? This is the second of a series on regenerative AI. Chris and I have been having quite a few roundtables with fellows on what could the fellowship collectively create as thought leaders and users and decided to broaden this out to the, include the New Zealand ecosystem. During the series, the fellows want to cover risk and reward to New Zealand, security and regulations, well-being, right through to AI being used as a tool positively in business, like today's session. We'll be having about a 45 minute conversation with the panel and then moving into Q&A and discussion with you all during the next 90 minute session. Now about your amazing moderator, Chris. He's from cohort four, who here and now lives in New Zealand and is a master in mentorship, coaching, agile training and mindful instruction. He does a lot behind the scenes in some of New Zealand's biggest organizations that you're probably not aware of. And I'm excited to have him moderating this AI series over the coming months. Just a bit of housekeeping, this session is being recorded and it will be on the website afterwards. So just stay muted until Q&A or you can put your questions in the chat box and Chris will um, put those out there. And some of you may have to leave and that is okay too. Over to you, Chris. Hi, thank you, Michelle. So um, it's a real delight to welcome our panelists. I'd like to start with Sam Eng, who has led product and service teams at UNDP's chief digital office to support countries and their national agendas with a focus on inclusivity, human rights, responsible tech use, emerging tech, public goods, and foresight. Rob Reed is a longtime tech entrepreneur, Rhapsody, current tech investor, science fiction author, and a science podcaster. And John Lee was a product designer at Facebook, Facebook Reality Labs, Microsoft, and Axon. And it's a real pleasure to have these thought leaders in the room. And I've, we've got some great questions lined up for you. So very much looking forward to sharing with you. So first, um, I, I've been in the thick of generative AI, but I'm really curious to hear from you. How big of a deal is generative AI really? Is this a pets.com moment, an iPhone moment? Oh, I'd say iPhone badly understates it. Um, you know, from my standpoint, I would say there have been probably in the history of humanity three user interfaces that utterly, fundamentally, completely reshifted the face, well, two, and I think this might be the third, the face of society and business. And to me, the first one was the duo of the telephone and the phone directory. Um, wasn't around then, but if we can certainly imagine um, how the rise of the telephone utterly transformed, you know, social lives, you know, the presence of distant people in one's life, um, all elements of commerce, price discovery, markets became national, um, you know, local commerce, just all kinds of things would have completely transformed. And if you held current, I mean, there were a lot of other transformations that happened at the same time, um, you know, electrification and other things. But I, I, would, I would submit that if you had held everything else, the other technological um, innovations that defined that early 20th century, you kept them constant. And you didn't have the telephone. There's no way society would have transformed to the degree that it did between, let's say, the 19 teens and the 1950s. Um, the next one, without any question, was the rise of the web browser and the web uh, and and the search engine. And again, we need hardly we can't even it's impossible to overstate how transformative that was. But these are things that basically transform the user interface through which we interact with almost all of the inputs of economy and information, and to a significant degree with the first two, and probably to a lesser degree with with generative AI. Um, interpersonal relationships as well, just completely re-architected. And, you know, the, the economy contorted and developed and, and just changed in completely unpredictable ways along with that. I, I believe that generative AI has the potential to, to be that big. And the reason is really in that first word, generative. Um, it's, you know, transitioning from a point where most queries, most requests 
for information and even for media and ultimately I believe for entertainment um, go from being a request for something that exists to a request for something that does not yet exist. And that is a really radical transformation. When you think about it, um, you know, querying Google for a bit of information, querying Netflix flicks for a movie, querying Spotify for a song, these are all basically asking for something from the great library that exists in the world that has largely now been digitized over the past few decades. I want this thing that exists that's going to satisfy my need right here, right now. And when that which we desire increasingly can be better generated than pulled from the archive, I think everything transforms. Um, now, I'm not going to, I don't have total conviction on this, but it's high and it's rising and it's been rising at a very rapid clip for the last five months. So I'm going to say iPhone might even understate this. And don't ask me about this whole Apple VR thing. That's a whole nother. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll get John to do that one later. Yes. I, yeah. If I can, if I add to that too, I, I totally agree, uh, Rob. I, uh, I'm a bit of a designer from way back as well. And one of the things that really got me about this uh, recently too is that sort of step you talk about um, the kind of conversational interface. Um, the GUI made a huge difference as well as the web browser, the graphical user interface just mm. kind of made a lot of communication that much more accessible. And one of the super exciting things of, I think about what we see with generative AI is uh, the conversations that we can have uh, using language. And I think language is such a big deal. You know, if you pause and really think about uh, language is really in some ways uh, the sort of medium for civilization, you know, we, we, we can't build the kind of modern world without being able to communicate in the way that we do across these hundreds, thousands of different kind of languages. And that's what's, I think, super exciting about it. And also, I'm, I'm sure we'll get to this, uh, quite, quite frightening about it, because that transformation is happening at that, that really core level of civilization in terms of how we communicate. All the words that I'm making now and the sounds that I'm making that are being transmitted to each of you uh, in, in the way in which it registers as a bunch of concepts uh, and as AI and as computers master that ability to uh, communicate through language, it just opens up all these kind of different doors. Um, exciting, um, possibly also uh, a little bit a little bit scary, but I, I think the one, well, one thing that's great about, regardless of whether or not we think uh, generative AI is a big deal or not, uh, one thing I'm really excited about having these conversations mean that we get to choose what happens next because I think the thing that's concerned me a bit about these conversations has been a certain form of determinism that the kind of narratives that we've heard so far have kind of led us to believe uh, there are these fixed futures that we don't get much of a say in so uh, and I, yeah I love to believe that we have more agency than we're sort of led to believe but yes, totally. Uh, iPhone, that's just really going to be a footnote. I think uh, if we look back even 10 years from now, there's going to be oh, we're at quite a significant inflection point. Yeah, I, I just want to build off of that um, in terms of transformation. Definitely think it's an iPhone moment, um, if not way more. Um, just I think what blew me away was it took Twitter five years to reach 100 million users and Instagram from the Facebook side of the world, two and a half years. And it took chat GPT 64 days to hit 100 million users just for that scale of speed. And it just blows my mind every couple of days, you just learn about some new kind of gen AI tool. And it's just, it's just fascinating the pace of, of development. And um, I, I think what what's also interesting in terms of the context was that with COVID and lockdown, I think Satya from Microsoft said that um, two years worth of transformation happened within two months during that lockdown time. And so you have that leading up to then all this Gen AI stuff that's coming out now, just a really, really fascinating time to kind of see what's developing. Thank you, thank you. And so, Sam, you spoke to looking beyond fixed futures. So that's a great segue into our next question, which is, what positive futures can you imagine with the integration of generative AI into everyday life 
And we'll start with a global context to kind of set the stage. So what positive futures can you imagine with the integration of generative AI into everyday life in a global context? Well, I want yeah, to first maybe I'll, I'll pick up on that because I, I have a bit of a different perspective perhaps than most in that um, in my day job, I, I try to think and advocate a lot for the billions of people who uh, not, not even connected currently to the internet, uh, for whom many struggle with electricity and shelter and power, some of the basic kind of needs that we take for granted. Um, having said that, I think those those prospects, that potential for some of this technology to really level the playing field, but also grant incredible access to people uh, in the ways that I think were incredibly difficult to do before because of some of these more traditional barriers, and maybe just picking up on my point about language, uh, for you to access the global economy, you tend to have to have a basic level of literacy uh, and also just even uh, ability to master a language, you know, to speak a, a global language like English, to be able to uh, access scientific knowledge, to access different markets. And as, uh, as the optimist in me, I think as those sort of barriers get removed and as we are able to... Uh, provide greater access to learning and healthcare and all those kind of basics uh, without the, the same kind of barriers. I think it's tremendously exciting to be able to craft possibilities for uh, you know what, what's often termed as the global South. Um, clearly there are scientific breakthroughs. There's a lot of uh, positive opportunities uh, in, in health and in, in learning that can happen as well. Um, but beyond that, uh, I think the sort of productivity increases, which, which are more near term, uh, how that can create more space for us as humans to either move into higher value work uh, or just even, uh, heavens forbid, create better well-being and balance for us as humans as we kind of come back to what we're good at and what we're in intended to do, as opposed to perhaps a lot of the sort of busy work, which I'm really looking forward to a lot of that busy work being taken away you know the more tedious and boring stuff that we just just you know don't need to do um and yeah personally i think the the, the kind of learning that that opens up to uh, all of us on this call but also billions of other people who who don't get the chance to even be part of this global conversation is going to be one that we get shaped which is which is going to be great i'd say one of the most sublime uh advances that i fully expect to see from this, and that I am definitely already experiencing, is going to be really just tremendous potential in education, particularly self-education. So, um, you know, it, it's, it is absolutely true that uh, a very high percentage of people, not all, but in a very high percentage of learning circumstances, not all, but high in both cases, um, learn with incredible It's not a very scalable enterprise for obvious reasons, but, you know, depending on the topic and depending on a particular person's learning mode, um, you know, building, you know, on what Sam said, you know, language is the most immediate way to get things in and out of our brains other than the visual cortex. It's certainly the most immediate way to convey thoughts and communicate thoughts. And as we scale up from, you know, we already have, you know, things that are text-based. But as we scale up from that, there's already, you know, tremendous voice synthesis technology that's out there and video is, is, is more expensive and more slow, but it is going to catch up. Um, when we get to the point where ChatGPT is really chatting to us with a natural, natural voice and, you know, for some people in some applications when it is also a human-like a human -like face that's conveying information to us, um, the ability to, and, and the large language models get more and more exquisitely tuned to have conversation and to detect holes in knowledge and to answer questions and to just very, very interactively instruct with a, with a memory of what this student has learned before and with an increasingly well-refined intuition for what they may not know based on what they've said. Um, I just think the ability for almost anybody to get educated, to self-educate, it won't be self-educated, it would be in collaboration with a model, but nonetheless, to, to, to upskill themselves and to learn will go far, far beyond the extraordinary things that are already possible with things like Khan Academy and Wikipedia. And um, I believe Sal Khan's TED Talk is now online 
Um, I was lucky enough to see him give it live. The TED, TED conference was just uh, in April, but I'm pretty sure his talk has already gone up. And if it has, um, Google it, because what they've done at Khan Academy with a tutoring bot is already unbelievable and far more unbelievable things are going to be in the pipeline. Myself, I, um, I have this sort of this deep science podcast that I'm lucky to, if I can do three or four episodes a year now, um, I used to, there's times when I've been able to do a couple of months, it varies, but I, I interview people from a really wide diversity of disciplines for it. And so I end up usually spending 30 to 40 hours preparing for each interview because it's like, oh, I got to go from neuroscience to astrophysics to oceanography. And for me, that's really the reason to do it is like this sort of joy of learning. And, and it's always under the tutelage of my guest, who's going to be like a world-class scientist in one of these, these areas. So I've done like, I've gone from, you know, zero to advanced layman in a lot of fields over the years. And as an investor, I, I need to do that too. And so I happen to be right at this moment in the conference room of a company that um, basically does enzyme discovery and development using machine learning, interesting stuff. I did not know a great deal about enzymes before I started looking into this company and getting ready to understand this company and what they do is was a lot like preparing for one of my interviews. And so it's like, here we go again. I've done this dozens of times. I know what to do. What's different now uh, compared to a year ago when I would prepare for a scientific interview is GPT-4 is an incredible way for me to navigate a new and complex scientific space. Um, you know, all my old tools like Wikipedia and other kinds of queries and finding lectures on YouTube and so forth, they're still there and I still use them. But, you know, the ability to get to something that is really targeted to my level of knowledge, and I can, I can answer my questions by finding the Wikipedia article on, you know, a particular domain of enzymes, but I can find it much more rapidly by asking GPT-4 and say, give me a 750 word answer. So little micro articles coming out, that's already just like a blinding increase in my, my efficiency learning. It's a narrow application of education, but I think it's gonna go across the board. And I think that humans are gonna become smarter and wiser at a much faster scale than ever before as a result of this. So that's what I get real excited about. Oh, that and shorter hold times on cus in customer service. <laughs> So that's my sublime thing and my mundane thing, but they both are important. I think you've been a bit optimistic about the uh, customer service thing. I don't think it's that good, eh? Like we're still going to be put on hold for different reasons. <laughs> oh, but you'll, it will be your AI <laughs> agent that's on hold. It's, and it has all the time in the world. <laughs> that's right. I have a point about agents, but John, I might let you jump in first. Uh, I think that was a pretty solid discussion. Um, you guys covered a lot of things I would have said. Sam, would yeah, you like to add anything? Yeah, yeah. I was just, I was just going to say, there's um, you, people have probably seen all kinds of different reports in terms of, you know, what that means for supercharging kind of productivity, both in terms of, you know, quantity and its kind of ramifications on jobs, la la la, all the rest of it. But I, I think this idea of a, a a digital agent, you know, something that is a, a virtual assistant for everyone in the organization, for yourself, I, I'm, I'm sure we've all probably played with this already and um, that that kind of prospect is uh, already gaining quite a bit of steam mm -hmm. and recently I had a, had a bit of a joke with a friend that wouldn't be great that instead of us having this kind of conversation which is filled with padding uh, that our agents could sort of you know, have this kind of conversation with with each other not necessarily just getting a uh, uh, these generative AI models to work on the outputs but perhaps uh, to get on the inputs from from humans but uh, have these conversations and sure enough these you know startups out there are really starting to to do this so in the in the in the near future perhaps you know what we kind of think of productivity now for better or for worse might be handled by uh autonomous agents that we get to design and fine-tune to our interests so fully with you there rob we're all going to be enzyme experts before we know it and that's a good or bad thing one of the quips that came up at the last panel is everybody has an intern now <laughs> not yet but at some getting point. there yeah yeah <laughs> Um, Sam, I, I just wanted to uh, build off of that. I think we'll, having designed for privacy, uh, I, I think what I'm most excited about is a, a personalized AI that kind of is much more on device as opposed to on the cloud. And therefore, um, now we're talking about AI and there's a lot of scary aspects to it. But now if it's purely on device and it's not 
necessarily connected to the cloud, then that level of AI is much more individualized and I, I can trust that a lot more. And so I, I'm super excited about the future of AI plus these closed networks and AI and perhaps even just within my household. And I think that's, that's a frontier that's, that's going to be really fascinating. Yeah, on that note, I, I guess we might get into it later on too. Um, what what the source of uh, the role of open source might be in in that regard, in terms of who actually has access uh, behind the curtains to what actually happens and and how that might be controlled. Thank you. So we've discussed some of the global benefits of generative AI. What what are the risks that you possibly see? Um, and how can we address these risks while still promoting the possible benefits? I just think there's going to be an ability to um, perpetrate fraud on an industrial scale that doesn't currently exist. And so I, uh, and one example that I've been thinking of and using a little bit um, lately is there is a there is a form of scam that we're all familiar with and we've all been exposed to, which is the Nigerian prince emails you and asks for your bank details in exchange for a small, you know, huge or potentially huge benefit. We've all gotten those emails because they are free, essentially free to send on a mass scale. Um, and they probably worked very briefly a very long time ago. And we all have our immune layers, you know, kind of booted up. Now, the consequence of booting up those immune layers are that when we in our normal life encounter Nigerian princes who are real Nigerian princes who want to hand us money, we're probably going to shut them down. But that's a pretty low cost that we're incurring as a result of that. Um, so move from that to a very labor intensive form of scam. There's something that's got a terrible name. It's called pig butchering. And that comes from the term of fattening up a pig for slaughter. And in this form of scam, um, and this will be a generic example, but you know, there's variations around this, but basically somebody will find a target in an environment where people, people meet people online. It might be a Discord, it might be Reddit, it might be a dating app, but the, the target is targeted and the perpetrator basically plays a very, very, very long game where they befriend this person, build up trust over an enormous number of interactions. At some point, say, oh my God, you work so hard, you deserve more from life, whatever it is. Uh, you know, is. I've got this really hot crypto tip. Now don't bet much, please don't bet much, whatever you do, but you know, here's, here's the tip and here's the exchange. The person's directed to a very legitimate seeming exchange. They make this small bet and it pays off huge. And they may even actually withdraw a little bit of money, but now they're hooked, the hook is set. And this is sort of the quote unquote fattening pay phase. And then over another span of you know, many, many days, weeks, even months, um, that hook is set and, and manipulated to the person. At some point, the person's betting more and more and more. They're getting addicted to their parent, but you know, ephemeral winnings. And at some point, their fake friend and their fake prospects and their real life savings all vanish. Um, there was a, one of these cases was documented. I think it was in Forbes. And the perpetrator and the victim swapped 271,000 words of text. And I can tell you as an author, that is the equivalent of an 800 page book. Um, no scammer will, however greedy they are, they can only do that so many times a year. Now in LLM, I'm sure this is gonna start happening at incredible scale. Now LLMs will be able to perpetrate that, you know, Turing test passing bots um, to not a few dozen of carefully selected targets, but extremely broadly. And now add the richer media, add the voice. And then later, and this really worries me a great deal, you know, eventually pixel perfect video, totally photorealistic. Um, in this environment, whether people are criminal scammers or they're more benign non-criminal marketers, or they're people who have a political agenda um, who are trying to, you know, um, you know, persuade somebody to come over to a fringe point of view or even a mainstream point of view. I worry that the number of fake people out there who are photorealistically seeming real might outnumber us online. And those, first of all, there's just the tremendous runaway potential for scams. But now think of how our immune layers start rising up. I'm not just merely suspicious of an Iderian prince offering me money, which doesn't really happen very often in my daily, daily life. So that's not a terrible expense. 
But these bots are going to become masters of micro expressions. They're going to become masters of feigning empathy. They're going to be masters of eliciting sympathy and pity. And they're going to become masters of all these subtle cues that basically make us human. And what happens when our immune layers start blotting that out? And, you know, start saying, okay, that's, you know, when I see that, I go, I shut down. And we start doing that for humans as well as bots. And we translate that to the offline world and online world. Um, I really, really worry about that runaway um, potential. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's dark. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One, uh, coming back to, I think my, uh, this is why I think language is so transformative, right? As you kind of sit here and listen to us make arguments, uh, trying to be eloquent about our points of view, uh, you could imagine that we stand no chance compared to a supercomputer in generating these kind of persuasive arguments. I think, Rob, as you've kind of pointed out, not only do they have the time, but they've got that kind of brute force ability to uh, you know, really manipulate based on language. And, and then, you know, for thousands of years, um, politicians and poets and all kinds of people have been using storytelling and language to really shape society. And actually one of the things, so putting putting on uh, kind of, again, the hat of institutions, democracies ultimately are uh, fundamentally are conversations in public. And it's lots of people talking to lots of other people about what to do collectively. And so as uh, AI and, and computers begin to master language, it, it can really shape those conversations. I mean, social media has shown us how that's plausible. And when when that that AI has been uh, unleashed, it, it may be quite challenging for us to better understand. Like you say, it's not just text. Uh, Robert's fully multimodal. Uh, how do we ensure that we have that ability to trust uh, how we have these conversations in public? Because this is uh, this is the way in which we address and solve many of the other challenges that we face as a, a society. Um, but having, of course, having said that, I, I think these are these are some of the current narratives that we hear over and over again. I think one of the things, things to come back to that question, Chris, of how do we how do we manage those risks while potentially still benefiting uh, people and planet? One of the key things is going to be the stories we tell each other. Um, this, you know. Uh, a lot of the things that we hear now provoke uh, responses of, I think, ignorance or despair, um, but really optimism, or maybe, maybe not, maybe I'm just listening to the wrong podcasts, um, but I think there are real opportunities for us to begin to, you know, create a broader civic engagement around, you know, what a positive, forward-looking, plausible vision of AI could be that isn't uh, determined by uh, some of the, you know, few actors that are having that conversation now and that that's going to be a lot of things I, I think there's going to have to be much better coordination cooperation in general this is obviously not just a US problem or a EU problem or a New Zealand problem um, this is well beyond any kind of geographic boundaries um, one of the big things I feel even for myself is just how do I keep pace how do I have adequate AI literacy and uh, let alone the people who, you know, it's easy to pick on education and that the poor educators and teachers are already so heavily overloaded. How do they keep pace with the opportunities and, and get a basic level of AI literacy to be able to respond? Um, same, same, of course, with our policymakers and our lawmakers and our leadership and, and our many civil servants who have to try and make sense of this. So I think there's got to be a, a real response, a balanced response for helping people come up to speed. Um, and at the core of it, and I'm, I guess I alluded a bit to this in terms of how we function as democracies, we get the opportunity to, I think, rethink how we organize work. A lot of work historically is based on technological as well as you know, organizational constraints. I mean, it's, you know, it's how many people we can manage, uh, how many hours in a day we've got. These are the languages we can speak. So some of these sort of assumptions and constraints may may benefit from a bit of a rethink as these technologies become a bit more mainstream. So choose to be more optimistic, I think. Uh, choose to tell better and different stories as, as a bit of a starting point, which, which is why I think it's exciting to have these sessions. You can't have the future you can't imagine.
John. Uh, yeah, I, it's just for in thinking about some of the risks of AI, I, I think it it kind of from the creative perspective, uh, there's a certain joy um, in my upbringing as a designer of um, just how many sketches I've do I've done just from childhood and leading up to now, and and as things get, become easier and faster and more powerful with all these AI tools, I, I worry about some of the convenience. And the speed of convenience taken away from the joys of um and joys and slash tediousness tediousness of learning something and the practice that it goes into something and i i don't know what that means for um the future of kind of some of these pursuits um but i i do worry uh how fast and easy it is to generate certain things that might take away from um the time that can be invested that eventually becomes quite, quite joyful in, in um, how that skill set blooms. Thank you. I want to see if I can narrow it down with you a little bit. So we've, we've spoken about the global context, and now I'd like to get a little more local with you. Um, what do you see as the future possibilities that excite or frighten you specifically within the New Zealand context? I wasn't really worried about our elections in September until I listened to the RNZ podcast recently. Um, a guy called Bob, Bob Reed, was it perhaps? Uh, that actually kind of just caused me to stop and think a little bit, you know, because obviously for some of us in New Zealand, we've heard about the kind of national political ad kind of fiasco where they, you know, use Mid Journey to generate a bunch of attack ads. Um, and I would like to think New Zealand's not the sort of place where this, this could be a, an issue. But we also forget that just a year ago, and this is what was highlighted in that podcast, uh, we had those parliamentary kind of protests. So there is a, a kind of growing kind of undercurrent of people who may, uh, and bad actors, who may use some of these technologies to their advantage and kind of so dissent. So in a, in a more immediate uh, sort of issue, I, I think that's a little bit higher on the risk list than I, than I thought. I think a lot of that focus is, of course, on the U.S., elections next year but uh in general i think this this idea of how we have uh, discourse in the public forum in the town hall in a way that can be trusted and it is respectful and how many of these technologies really accelerate that perhaps in the wrong way that's that's something that uh is definitely on on my mind um related to that i think it's just the sheer speed in which everything runs so this is an you know, New Zealand specific, but I, th I think part of what we underestimate is just how quickly things are uh, developing. And while some of these use cases at the moment and the applications are quite laughable, uh, we can expect uh, things to grow only quite exponentially from here on in. And then the other thing that I think that's both uh, frightening, but also quite exciting is just New Zealand as a bicultural society, how if we were to do this right, and I think there are many possibilities for us to kind of think about how we might better encode the values of um, a Maori uh, perspectives and worldviews into large language models, into algorithms, into how we uh, engage in public conversations and better understand each other. I think there's a fantastic opportunity for us to uh, globally be a voice that can be recognized for how to do this well. And that is, of course, something that I am putting on my uh, more global hat I, I see as an opportunity everywhere but it's definitely one that yeah is going to take a bit of effort for us to make happen I, I think tying just what, what Sam said to you know the sort of the pig butchering thing not that I really like saying the words pig butchering but um you know is is generative models accelerate um you know, s smaller targets become profitable, okay? And so currently the people who get targeted with these kinds of scams are people who have a lot of money to lose when they can be automated and talking about the pig butchering scam now, you know, they'll go after people with $5,000 in life savings. You can't do that profitably now. Now transition over to sort of election mayhem, that kind of thing. 
Um, I don't know how much effort went into QAnon perpetrating that, but that was a pretty big fraud perpetrated on a pretty, you know, pretty fat target, the United States and its political system and all the money that courses through its veins. Um, that made sense to somebody. And, you know, kind of all the synthetic media and other things that were done to hijack our election, now we're seeing turning up in, in New Zealand elections. I think these kind of like larger scale frauds and hijackings of democratic processes that probably only would have been drawn to a very, very, very large target, you know, is going to be, is much more likely to be drawn to a 5 million person democracy. Whereas in the recent past, it might have been limited to, you know, a multi hundred million person democracy. And so I think that's probably a risk that we can see. Joan, would you like to chime in? Okay. So I suspect we'll find some policymakers who will be here or watching this video. And I'm curious. What advice might you give to policymakers? Uh, what are some of the levers that might be available to them? Um, and I know, Sam, you, I believe you spoke a little bit to AI literacy, and even just keeping up with, even just keeping track of the companies that are popping up in this space, let alone being able to understand their products is like drinking from a fire hose. So I'm curious, what advice would you give policymakers beyond pursuing AI literacy, particularly here in New Zealand? I think that's a pretty good place to start. And I think a lot of the attention at the moment turns to the heads of organizations. So you have these you know, big talking heads, which which absolutely that conversation needs to happen and they need to be better educated in terms of um, the headlines of what's actually kind of going on. But often I see uh, the kind of middle management layer, if you like, the actual operators themselves uh, who have to actually take these you know, bullet points and these tasks and convert it into something meaningful. And they get all kinds of pressures kind of squeezed on then. I think we're specifically targeting them and prioritizing a bit of effort uh, to do that. New Zealand's a small place and you know, Wellington's a pretty small place. And there are a handful of people who are willing and able perhaps to provide that level of education in an informed, hopefully in balanced way without a bunch of agenda, agendas attached to it. Um, so I, I think that really is the, the, the core starting point. And just to tie back to the, you know, the, the importance of being a bicultural society as well, uh, ensuring that we have all of society around for that conversation and for different perspectives to be integrated in uh, understanding where the technology go is going and how how we can leverage that is going to be, I think, a, a part of our strength, because um, it, the temptation is very much to copy what, and, and you know, there's an inevitability. To copy what other countries are doing just because of the sheer size of who we are in New Zealand. But there are lots of different ways in which we can reshape this conversation as well um, to be to be a good kind of treaty partner and think about how this works in the digital world and the digital era as well. I think that's um, going to be something that EHF is particularly strong at adding value to as well. Um, at a really practical level and how we might translate that, I think there's possibilities for us to think about what sandboxes would look like from a policy perspective uh, as well. Um, and maybe there are uh, opportunities and spaces uh, to create these sort of certification or uh, auditing systems um, where, again, uh, we could think about what are the things that are important to us as a society, what are the sort of values and the outputs and the outcomes that are important, and perhaps not to to use you know, the hard sort of stick of regulation, but just to be able to hold up a bit of a light against the different tools that are going to be used in New Zealand. It, it's um, to be able to say, you know, this is this is how well this might stack up against the values that we hold dear as a society or a bunch of things that are non-negotiables for us um, in terms of, you know, the different tools. Like, you know, we could, we could do this with mid-journey and we could just kind of, shout out you know some here some of the things that we've observed uh that contradict or perhaps uh it's almost like a warning label that we get on foods you know for for different tools that come into um common use so there's already some great work i think um some beginnings of some great work there's an algorithmic charter in new zealand it's <clears throat> ever fairly lightweight um still uh lacks that kind of detail but 
I, I do think that sort of enablement of public sector, that middle management and operational layer is going to be pretty key to getting real stuff done, not just positioning statements, ethic guidelines and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, is, is part of the course. Uh, I wonder what the support system looks like for um, automation and the layoffs that will come with automation and what that means for transitioning that um, displaced labor and how I, I think in Japan they had the system where in a company, if there's a massive layoff that happens, um, that company will loan some of those employees to other companies while they try to figure out um, how to transition those workers. And just really curious what could be a contextualized New Zealand cultural kind of support system for displaced labor that comes with automation and artificial intelligence. And um, yeah, what kind of system can come in place? And I think, um... You know, from my perspective, regulation is is public policy is in some ways fraught because as digital tools, these are going to be innately in international and they're going to travel with you know at light speed. And the people who are seem to be most concerned about AI risk um, are really talking about international agreements and international accords, like the Nuclear Test Demand Treaty, which I think is actually good. That we're thinking internationally about this already. It's so rare that we think internationally about anything as a species, and it's good that that's this has ascended to that level. Um, but what I think is intriguing about New Zealand is it is so much more of an agile government than we have where I live, and it's more almost like a really speedy sports car compared to a great big lumbering truck. And great being lumbering trucks are good for certain applications, but when you want agility and speed, you know, there, there's tremendous benefit to that as well. Here, the, the giants of AI are present here, and there's going to be all kinds of contortions um, that enter any kind of legislative or public policy process as a result of their presence and the depth of their pockets. Um, New Zealand is a much more pure place for, I think, discussion and ideation and probably legislation. And so... I think it'd be really interesting if New Zealand really took a lead on certain forms of regulation, ones that don't presuppose that you can tell what Google what to do, because I don't even know if the US government can, but policies that sort of um, make the, the public digital sphere safer. Um, and I think New Zealand could plausibly, you know, create really good common sense legislation that then it's it's much easier to evangelize something that's already a law in a country um, that's, you know, that's well regarded internationally, that is excelled in a lot of areas like public health and so forth. Um, you know, so just a simple example, like, you know, an AI warning label and it's sort of, you know, to pick up one Sam said, just something that says you are talking to an AI now, you are looking at AI generated content that just needs to be present. We're not going to ban anything. We're not going to prohibit the creation of anything. But if this is a bot, if you are a bot that's, you know, generating content in, you know, a chat sphere, you're talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, you need to put up the AI flag. People need to know when they're interacting with AI. Kind of coming off of that off the top of my head, but that's, that's the kind of thing that New Zealand is a big enough market that people are not going to want to simply ignore it. It's a light, very light regulatory burden to place on entities and people. Now, obviously, fraudsters are not going to go along with that, but that's a light regulatory burden. You can geofence it and implement it quite easily. And it could be, you know, a very, very powerful, simple, powerful thing that could be very contagious to the legislator, legislative bodies of other countries. I think there's a real opportunity to innovate here in a country that can move quick and think deeply. And I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, maybe to add to that too, I think these possibilities for us to demonstrate what uh, different visions and different futures could look like. So as well as the kind of dominant models that exist, and we might touch on this later on, but open source is catching up fast. Mm. And, you know, there are new models now that uh, can be fine-tuned to produce different outcomes. So imagine if we did bring a bunch of technologists together, and to your point, Rob, right? I mean, we, we can potentially move fast enough and get government buy-in 
to get to create a, a model that is um, you know uh, cognizant of Maori values and uh, perspectives and how might we take one of those uh, existing models and uh, tune it in a, in a way that like you say might uh, just offer a different uh, window into how these can be used and demonstrate that as uh, something that can and, and, and observe kind of how that might be co-created with the people of New Zealand as an, as an alternative as well. So rather than to, again, accept this kind of form of determinism that what Google and OpenAI AI have produced is kind of what we have to put up with, uh, I think we've got that kind of pioneering spirit and, and ability to move quickly to, to try different things as well. And with, like you say, with the blessing of, you know, some of the country's uh, decision makers, because they are they are very accessible and um, as perhaps the, <laughs> this video might show, right? One of the things that I'm really curious about listening to this, and Sam, following on from your open source comment, um, I've read an article recently that Google is quite terrified of open source AI models, so they're less worried about uh, open AI and more worried about the open source models. And so I'm curious, um, what additional regulatory challenges might that present? If the US can't tell Google what to do, how might we be able to regulate when an informal group of people can build uh, let alone malicious actors. How does that change regulatory model if there's no one to hold accountable? Yeah, <laughs> let alone the uh, global kind of coordination, uh, cooperation kind of a challenges, right? Um, so yeah, they they simultaneously terrify me and excite me at the same time. Um, and depending on the on the day, I, I think open source, how we viewed open source in the past isn't necessarily how we could consider it uh, sort of offering us the same kind of benefits going forward. But there are some models which are closing in very quickly on GPT-3 and 4 uh, in terms of performance. And I guess it is, again, it's up to us as to how we make good use of those. I'm with Rob in that, and again, kind of sitting where I sit uh, within the multilateral environment, I struggle to imagine how we can keep pace uh, it's it's a necessary guardrail. We are going to have to do this. Uh, governments are going to have to signal intent and cooperate with each other. But just just the, the, the rate of change is just just too difficult. So we're going to have to find different ways. I think more carrots than sticks. Knowing that we're going to need sticks, but we're going to have to demonstrate. Uh, I think better uses for this. Uh, and to a certain extent, I think we're going to need technical innovation to be able to counter some of the challenges that, you know, and it, it, that even um, uh, those examples you gave, Rob, we're just going to find technical innovations. We're going to have to support technical innovations as well as um, grow awareness and literacy to counter this and expect that regulation will do its best, but we're going to need more than that as a defense. Rob or John, would you like to jump in? I think from a defense label layer standpoint, just sort of going narrowly to that, um, the way most of us are defended against spam and viruses is not the law. It's anti-spam, you know, programs and software. But you know, Gmail protects me from the vast majority of spam that comes at me because I happen to use Gmail, or it's antivirus software. And so I think you know, we do need to regulate well, but we also hopefully will have economic incentives in place um, for defensive layers to be built by people who are good at building defensive layers. I was talking to um, the CEO of a company called Resemble.ai, which is a really good, one of the top voice synthesis companies. I interviewed him for my podcast and actually uh, just posted the episode um, if folks are interested. Um, and he was talking about a digital watermarking technology that they have that will, that's pretty interesting. So um, what they can do is they can watermark a person's voice and you could have your voice watermarked whenever you'd put any spoken content online. And if somebody ends up training on the vocal content that you have online, the watermark is kind of invisible. That generated voice that's generated from, you know, the surreptitiously watermarked content that you have out there will be discernibly, it will be shown this was trained from a model. And this was trained from pre-existing, you know, vocal content. 
Now that doesn't help somebody like me. He's got many dozens of hours of my voice already online. That's not watermarked. But I think that that's a really interesting go forward technology. And another thing that they enable to do and, and is, you know, they can go like, let's say you're in a family and you are very concerned about somebody scamming you by calling you and mimicking the voice of a loved one, or you're an organization and you're worried about any one of your 175 people being called by somebody mimicking the voice of the CEO trained on a model. Um, he believes, and we talked through some technical reasons why he believes it's feasible and it sounds incredible to me, um, families and organizations can do much more, much deeper training on the voices of the people in that family, in that organization, so that something that is a even a pretty good digital mimicry will have a hard time fooling the system that's been trained on the people you're trying to defend. Um, so th that's just an example in a domain of voice. But I do think that these defensive layers will be developed and I think they can become very powerful and we definitely need those to be out there as well. Rob, just kind of riffing off of that, if I was given these constraints as a product designer, I would try to imagine it living on my phone. And as I'm talking, um, if I had um, a personalized AI bot working for me, um, you could imagine a way to design um, tools to kind of help filter through a lot of different phone calls that you get or messages that you get. Um, I can imagine uh, like a web browser and as it's blocking a lot of pop-ups and spam and a lot of de details, you could take that parallel example and then build out ways to show some of these AI defense layer that um, kind of Rob was speaking to. And uh, I think my product design hack kind of goes a hundred miles per hour. Cause I think there's a lot of ways to contextualize that information, have an AI personalized bot that lives with you and then present that information to you so that you can kind of filter through what's what's human, what's AI, what's uh, good for your everyday use case. Yeah, and uh, one, uh, at, at a kind of more ecosystem level, I wonder how we can better support and create incentives for a lot of these kind of innovations that, like you say, might just make it a more efficient market. And so one thing that I've heard, which I think is interesting, is just how might we ensure that finance, uh, people that finance a lot of this stuff, um, have some kind of, uh, I hate to use the term ESG, right, but there's, there's an aspect of kind of ethical and safe AI, for, especially for those who are investing in this, uh, that is part of the criteria, that is part of also, in fact, uh, the, the, the appeal of financiers. So when it comes to technology entrepreneurs, when it comes to people building a lot of this stuff, um, there are some sort of incentives to do this right. And not only from a philanthropic perspective, but I think from the perspective of, you know, uh, those that control the cash uh, have some kind of influence over what good looks like. And there are lots of different tools that are out there. And it's just some basic kind of hygiene being put into thinking about whatever the unanticipated kind of consequences of what we're doing. What are some ways in which we can mitigate this? And what are some of the tools that we might want to begin supporting? Um but yeah, having said that, I mean, there are lots of other, I'm sure, initiatives too. And even as, as a fellowship, there are going to be lots of super talented people here. I mean, John, your, your brain's already kind of you know, jumping to a bunch of different possibilities. Uh, how, might, how might the fellowship even be able to create space? Um, because it's a limited talent pool too at the moment, right? The people who really know what they are doing, um, you kind of have this opportunity to, to make millions of dollars a year in salary somewhere, with potentially huge upsides, or you can give up your job and you know work for a pittance and kind of join the what's and can sometimes feel like the failing uh, side of defending and regulating some of these technologies. So how how do we how we change that equation as well? And I think that's something that we need to kind of consider as a way of just building more and more of these kind of innovations to you know, effectively prevent spam from hitting our inboxes because yeah that's uh it's already happening isn't it and it seems like even today with the current maturity of these models we're having difficulty detecting the text uh, i see a lot of commentary on social media people that have been confidently accused of their by the professors of 
having models write their papers for them only to be embarrassed when the same model or the same tool said the constitution was 95 percent gpt written so there's some interesting challenges there um thinking about new zealand again new zealand has a history of punching above its weight i think we're kind of known for that and we spoke a little bit to the adaptability of our legislators, how that we can move a little bit more quickly due to our scale. But I'm curious, what other ideas do you have for New Zealanders, either tech entrepreneurs or legislators, about how we can really punch above our weight using this technology? What advice would you give? I'll, I'll offer a practical, really simple one. I, I don't know a lot about it, but what I have seen in the film and gaming industry excites me tremendously uh, in terms of uh, an industry that punches above our weight. And I, I think we might have had one of these live streams before in this area. But, you know, the notion that this undermines the creative industries is perhaps a bit of a short-sighted one. The possibilities for that kind of resilient and pragmatic innovation that New Zealand is well known for in this sector to really redefine what that looks like in the future, I think is amazing, like, like double down on it. Um, so I think that possibility for us to really um, do some pretty creative things and re reimagine what that looks like at a practical level is uh, really good. Um, back to New Zealand being a bit of a, uh, a leader in terms of soft power on the global stage demonstrating how we can do this better in even our startup space would be would be fascinating and rob i, I think it'd be interesting to get your views on on how you see this kind of serving new zealand and, and the us but you know uh, as well as as more kind of formal mechanisms would there be ability for entrepreneurs in new zealand to think about how they can use it but also be accountable to someone maybe there's some kind of peer accountability in terms of how uh, technologists and uh, the boards in which they're accountable to talk a bit about what they're doing and what they're looking to adopt. So against a small community, it's probably easy. In fact, there will be lots of different ecosystems that are really talking a lot about this, uh, both in terms of the entrepreneurs, the actual talent themselves, as well as the, the people that finance it. So um, building kind of generally more positive tools uh, as, a, as a tech community and a tech ecosystem um, would perhaps um, draw more talent as well to New Zealand. This is such a this is a field that was really dominated by academic world until pretty recently. I mean, there's obviously some vitally important research that's gone on in a lot of corporations. Above all, the attention is everything uh, paper heralded the rise of transform models came out of Google. But the the history of academic labs really driving forward AI innovation is unbelievably important. And um, you know, this just popped in my mind as we were talking about it. Um, but New Zealand is such an unbelievably attractive place to visit um, and visit for long periods of time. Goofy idea. But, you know, it would be very interesting if the, if the government said, we are going to target every AI academic of consequence in the world and offer them the coolest six month sabbatical program. Come for a semester. We're not asking you, you know, to move this vast distance your entire... But, you know, an incredible amount can be learned in a single semester from the right professor. And I think if there was just a recruiting program to say every AI professor of consequence throughout the world, we are going to give you a really, really cool one semester sabbatical program to come down here. You're going to do well financially. You're going to be living in a beautiful place. You're going to have this fabulous experience. And, you know, I think you could potentially have an extremely high ratio of the world's great AI academics in there at any given time. Yes, it will be a different group every six months, but that's just fine. Um, I think that'd be cool. That'd be very cool. I love it. Right? And plus you get access. And not that expensive. And then yeah. you would train this incredible wave of students. It's amazing how many people who are great in this field are right out of school because they've just came out of these academic hands. Sorry, so, sorry Sam, I just got too excited. No, no, totally. And, and, and back to kind of our earlier point about, you know, uh, educating our civil servants and our lawmakers as well and our business leaders, right? Like uh, I think the possibility for a small kind of cohort of people to be educated and to be really curious about what these kind of global academic experts are thinking about. Mm -hmm. 
sounds like an EHF 2.0. <laughs> John, would you like to jump in? Okay. So um, question from uh, Larry in the chat, and I think this will be of interest to Aaron as well. Um, what's your sense around intellectual property? Um, you know, these models are trained on a variety of data sources, some of which may be intellectual property. Um, what do you see as the potential impact on creativity and innovation as we know it? Chris, are you asking? Oh, sorry. Sorry, you, you jumping? I'm asking the panelists. No, it's really I, tough. Uh, it you is, know, yeah. how, do, how do you know what it's really trained on? I mean, you know, stability gave itself away because it trained on so many Getty images. When it was asked to create an image, in many cases, it started reproducing the Getty watermark. And, you know, that's busted. But it's really, I think, in many cases, it's going to be very, very hard to tell what body of work something was trained on. And, you know, and another, this is obviously, this is sort of a, a sort of a playful example, but you know, if somebody goes to school and they read a whole bunch of texts and they train their brain. And then they start doing things because they've read a lot of a lot of knowledge. Nobody's saying they don't get to think new thoughts and create new things. Um, obviously, it's there are lots of ways that that's inapplicable, but it's hard. You know, I think it's hard to determine what something was trained upon, and particularly if something novel, unique, and generated and generative is coming out of it. I don't know if it, it's hard to throttle that too. I'm not saying this isn't a problem. It is one. It's just a very hard one. Yeah, I think it's it's the sort of thing that we're going to have to rethink because um, wealth often accrues from kind of assets that used to be land and perhaps arguably in some ways intellectual property has sort of been that moat uh, for a lot of different people and organizations. And so, so the, the natural thing will be for entrenched interests to really dig their heels in um, but to your point, Rob, I, I think there's this kind of tsunami of just uh, progress in terms of how we think about creativity, how we think about defensibility, and even our rights to some of this that have all largely been built on top of other people's work as well, um, to not perhaps have the same kind of protectiveness. Uh, and there are some areas clearly where, you know, if, if in pharmaceuticals, you spent billions of dollars and, and the protectability and defensibility of, of that and entire business models have been been made. Um, but this the the, the area where uh, yeah at the lighter kind of touch areas where we're talking about uh, trademarks or uh, copyrights, that's that's really up for grabs, isn't it? In the, in the next kind of five years as we think about what it really does mean for us to produce unique works and what kind of ownership we have over that. Uh, given that again. A lot of our energy can go there simultaneously. I feel our energy can go towards new possibilities and new forms of media and new forms of creativity that uh, we have yet to discover that might, again, supercharge uh, personal and collective productivity if we were to channel our efforts into the kind of more abundant worldview rather than the more kind of, you know, uh, scarce worldview of being able to protect what's rightfully ours. But it's easy for me to say because I don't hold a whole lot of a IP or copyright on a bunch of stuff that's been <laughs> plagiarized. Yeah, just really quickly, I'm I'm really curious what the evolution of ownership is, and and given the Web three NFT space, uh, I'm I'm just really curious how this is going to rapidly evolve, and we'll see how a lot of court cases currently are trying to set precedents for for all this kind of stuff. And so I'm, I'm just waiting to see how all this plays out. And it's interesting that the United States Copyright Office has stated that works created by non-human entities like AI can't be copywritten. So that's kind of an interesting thing where, okay, I can build something standing on the shoulders of giants, but then I don't get to just take it. And uh, I'm curious how that will evolve. I think the same thing can be said of patents as well. Um, you know, can you patent something that was generated by an AI and how would you be able to tell? Um, is that a regulatory thing that we could do that might 
um, might offer a little bit of a safer harbor. I believe yeah, it's patent in the, the USPTO is, has already said, no, you cannot patent something. I think somebody actually created, a, as a specific test of this, somebody submitted a patent quite recently that was very specifically attributed to the AI that he worked with. And the USPTO said no. So that's at least, you know, narrow case of patent office. But I think in some ways, it, these run the risk of being very naive regulations because I actually think we're entering a world of what I call centaurs, which are, you know, the mythical beast, half person, half beast, now half person, half machine. And I think that certain great creative collaborations are going to be the results of somebody who's a very good visual artist working carefully with Midjourney and creating something that's a synthesis of their strengths. You know, as a writer, um, you know, I haven't really done it yet, but I could imagine at some point in the future, I might be collaborating with an LLM to, you know, be more prolific than I would be otherwise and to create things that I'm perfectly proud of and, and willing to put my name on that are distinctively mine, but we're in some way accelerated. Um, by an LLM. And if there is a blanket, you know, okay, fine. If you hit the button and out pops a work and you did nothing but a forward prompt, is can can we say that shouldn't be copyrighted? You know, sure, I don't have a problem with that. But when it's a really intense collaboration between somebody who is an artist and a master of a tool, and that tool has generative properties, I think it's a gray area we, we need to be very careful about. There's a great book called Homo Deus uh, that I kind of scanned recently that talks a little bit about those centaurs, Rob, but we're kind of moving towards this kind of digital reality in the next step of the human kind of journey. I'll definitely plus one to that. I was, that was I, Yuval Harari, right? Uh, uh, I'm it? sorry. That was Yuval Harari, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also kind of wondering if there's a, like a second order derivative that might eventuate from some of this. Like in, in COVID, for example, we... Um, all jumped onto you know platforms like this and as soon as we we're able to we flocked to events and we kind of longed for this kind of human to human sort of contact and so as we kind of see this immediate kind of rise of um, a lot of automation we we might kind of also move into uh, kind of more analog there might be a whole kind of secondary market of much more analog uh, systems uh, patents that are exclusively human or perhaps artworks that were hand-drawn and there might be, um, for those who can uh, kind of afford that luxury, I think as well, uh, there, there might be just a rise in this cottage niche industry as well. Yeah, I love the example of someone pointing out you could get a, a, a highly optimized uh, supply chain built um, Blu-ray DVD player for $30, but yet um, pay $500 for this handcrafted pottery bowl and there's just this difference between the handprint of a human versus this highly optimized consumer electronic and the value that's placed on both of those things. It re really seems that in the future, authenticity and humanness are gonna be qualities that will be especially valued. And what does it mean to be human? And, and even what is our truth if these models get so good that they can generate realistic content. Uh, what can you believe if you don't see it or hear it in person? Mm -hmm. And do we have to be so dogmatic about our definition of human as well? Because mm -hmm. one thing we haven't really touched on here is, is kind of like the intimacy and the kind of loneliness problem that a lot of these agents are beginning to solve as we're seeing people, you know, be all to uh, a chatbot on your phone actually form these very real kind of relationships with uh, agents um, the, the likes of which are, you know have all kinds of consequences but as as we begin to kind of form different relationships and and write a new chapter I guess in our humanity but you're right I think there's um there's some kind of very real face-to-face -face things that we're probably going to value uh, and treasure much above all the more commoditized kind of services that we're going to be offered soon we really have access to I'm reminded of a movie that came out 10 years ago, Her, by Spike Jones, and just the future that that presented. And although I'm not so keen on the ending of it, um, you know, the, there's a real, I think, hopefulness as well. So I've got just one question for the three of you to wrap up, and then I'd like to open up questions to our audience. 
So what recent and coming potential development in generative AI has you most excited? What's the one thing that you've seen recently or on the horizons particularly got you fired up and alive? For me, it's what Rob has mentioned before. I've um, dabbled in kind of educational technology in the past. Uh, I was in Cambodia and I, I realized that there was not a strong sort of middle management kind of workforce and that was all kind of linked to education as well as Cambodia's kind of history and part of that challenge was of course there's just no quality Cambodian content uh, for preschoolers and we can never get enough teachers to go to the places where you know they're most needed uh, and that's a human scaling and institutional scaling problem um, a lot of kind of what is being done with MOOCs but supercharged now I think potentially with generative AI opens this huge world of possibility uh, for billions of people to be a part of this kind of global conversation and all the privileges I think that that offers as well I think that's super exciting I, I really do believe there will be some uh, fantastic innovations I, I do hope that they get evenly distributed uh, across the global south and not just the global north um, and I think that's pretty exciting that co compounded with that would be open source's role in perhaps hopefully making that happen um, so that would be my my two big ones, keeping a close eye on what's happening in open source, which again, I think we touched on briefly before, it is, is simultaneously terrifying as well as uh, pretty exciting. Uh, and it's immediate kind of application to education. I think one thing I saw recently was a demo of Humane's um, device, how it lives on your chest and you can have conversations with it and can speak to other people in different different languages and translate things for you. I think there's some definite pros and cons there, but I think as a personal computing device that um, that works with you in your own context, um, I think we've barely started to see what's possible. I've, I've been seeing some research um, that's coming out of, there's a, there's a model called ESM, uh, it's an LLM that came out of meta it stands for i think evolutionary scale modeling and i think esm2 just came out asm1b was out a little bit earlier and what it does is it you know basically in instead of letters it's amino acids and it's basically you know every protein every significant genetic sequence probably a lot of just natural peptides in, in, as small as that um are in this in, in this model and um it's been particularly good for antibody research at this point. And um, I think, you know, the, the potential to create novel proteins that could, you know, that, that aren't currently, you know, being coded for in the human genome or any genome, but have the chemical properties and the dimensional properties, the folding properties, which we're now much, much better at predicting than we used to be. Thank you to, thanks to AI as well. A lot of work out of deep mind on that one. Um, has just extraordinary potential for life science. And so that's something that's starting to come online. Meta did create this really interesting LLM. People are starting to get, you know, again, particularly in antibodies, it hasn't apparently done as much as enzymes yet, but you know, that'll probably be coming soon. Um, I think there's just a lot of life science potential here because, you know, life uses just a different alphabet with 20 letters instead of 26 or four, depending on how you look at it, or 64 if you count all the codons, but you know what I'm saying. And of course, there's the corollary risks of that of people using generative AI to create novel pathogens as well, uh, particularly with the availability of desktop CRISPR printers. Oh, yeah, that's something I worried about professionally for about two years. <laughs> Joe, would you like to jump in? Yeah, another thing that came out of Facebook, uh, I, I, I still call it Facebook just, just because of my type there, um, is this tool, this AI tool where just I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old uh when you doodle when you upload a doodle uh this ai model can animate it for you and i just love um whatever doodles my boys make to then use this ai tool to create these kind of like storybooks for them and that relationship i have with them then to showcase um this tech at their own level is is uh really fun for me 
I'd, I'd add one more, which is in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there is the Babel fish, all right? <laughs> I, I deal with a lot of people who are forced to learn English, and I am in constant admiration for how they have learned to communicate so eloquently in a language that is not their native language. Mm. And I think, I hope, perhaps, uh, there will be a Babel fish coming up pretty soon because of all these LLMs, heaven forbid there's even work in you know, communicating with animals, right, through through AI, um, that that can open up a whole new kind of world of possibility for us in terms of understanding our place in this world and bring about mm-hmm. a whole lot of empathy in the way in which we communicate with each other. So, um, yeah, go the Babel fish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'd like to open up to questions from our audience. We've got about five or six minutes for questions. And I invite you to either raise your hand physically or virtually or post a question in chat. We'd love to hear your questions. Why people are just thinking of one, I'm just going to throw something in the chat. It's a uh, link that the previous panel recommended for reading. It comes through mm-hmm. daily. But um, they all thought it was it's their best site that they go to. But mm. quick reads on like companies that are using AI and that are spinning out kind of all the different things you've been talking about today. Thanks, MC. It does make me wonder at what stage people will actually still be reading things, given that um, so much content's been generated at the moment. <laughs> we just have no time and space to read this exponential kind of rise. Mm. Sorry, did I cut someone off? No, one of the analogies that comes to mind for me is the song, The Future's So Bright, I've Got to Wear Shades. And it's this incandescent bloom of content that we now must filter. So... In fact, it may be a, an apt metaphor for how we might be looking at the world in the near future. We need better filters. Yes, please. Giant Trent. summarization tools. Yes. Trent, yes, what's your question? Hi. Um, so it also reminds me of the line is um, nobody knows what it's all about, but everyone thinks it's great, um, which is from They Might Be Giants. Um, but um, I'm interested, I saw this in um, the idea that Indigenous knowledge um is not often written in the internet um it's not documented um or not documented in the ways we know and obviously the the as we move forward if we're training things based on information available it may not be available and may lead to a further demise of uh of of deep knowledge of place and and etc and i'm interested I, maybe sam has a comment about that but maybe anyone does I, i'm not sure I certainly do, Trent. That was one of the first things we raised as a uh, agency in kind of collaboration a little bit with um, other agencies, particularly groups like UNESCO, whose whose job is to preserve kind of heritage and indigenous knowledge. But you're right, right? That ability for us to double down, not just on the digital divide, because frankly, half, nearly a billion people still have no kind of access to to the internet, let alone all the more advanced things. Um, but our ability to to digitize, um, I mean, there's some technologies like voice. I think, uh, Rob, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, that we're going to move kind of off written text, which also lowers the barrier from a literacy perspective and supports oral traditions. Um, but the importance really for us as a society to deem that valuable, uh, to be able to be put effort into digitalizing that, um, because otherwise we do end up and we already are in a place where we've got uh, a monoculture in the same way that corns dominated our kind of agricultural landscape we sort of are exporting these uh you know it's a form of digital colonialism it's it's just kind of exporting a, a bunch of values that are baked in uh into these llms and into these kind of models and so if we're not careful and we kind of just uh willingly kind of accept in fact market forces will determine that for us in, in, in large part uh we will get uh increasingly homogenous in terms of how we viewed the world and um, that's again back to kind of where I think New Zealand can really lead on the world stage we can demonstrate how we could do this better um, and demonstrate that there is an alternative and that's kind of something that we hold dear as a society there we go time for one more response or one more question what's emerging in the room 
there was an example of that actually at a, a at a level and event that we're at, Sam, when everyone was doing their reflection circle and they were doing their thank you of the event. Mm. And someone read out uh, the response from chat GPT. It covered everything everyone else said in the room except for the part on honoring uh, iwi and all the rest of that with it. It was actually because in that you're right, because there was no content on there for it to pick it up. So it's already been, it was a really prime example of how it came through. And we're like, wow, yeah, it was really interesting. Mm. A couple more questions and comments came in, one from Kelly. Is there a common public myth about AI you think we need to dispel? Hmm. That it knows everything. I think this is one that most people who are in this space already are quite aware of. We're lazy people, and we are going to basically turn to this oracle that is the AI personal assistant for everything, and that is terrifying but also or <laughs> too attractive so I, th I th yeah I think that that is a myth that we might willingly buy into uh, uh, what, John what came up for me is that um, there's a lot of concern for AI and um, the thing that I hope people can be more precise about that is I, I'm less worried about AI. I'm, I'm more worried about the people and the companies directing mm -hmm. uh, AI. And I, I think the focus has been on artificial intelligence and what things are coming out of it. But it's still at the end of the day, it's the the people and the company's intent that's really driving things. Mm -hmm. I think one myth might be the governments are in charge. Um, you know, if you read some of the people who are worried about the existential risk posed by gener by AI, not generative AI specifically, um, there are some very, very sound arguments there. And, and you know, Sam Altman himself said that he fears that this has the potential of nuclear weapons or worse. Um, you know, for all of the imperfections of the U.S. government in the 1940s, it was nonetheless, you know, the delegated arm of a large democracy of people that ended up developing tremendously powerful weapons. And then the people who had stewardship of those weapons over the subsequent decades were not all certainly coming up from democracies, but they were, you know, representatives of governments that in some way or another, you know, were offshoots of societies that in some way or another represented at least some perspectives of those societies. And this point, these unbelievably powerful and potentially wildly destructive tools are coming out of um, private companies, which in some cases are quite tiny and in no cases were elected by anybody. And, you know, the amount of resident knowledge within OpenAI about AI probably exceeds that of any government on the face of the earth. And so we are looking to policymakers to rein things in and put guardrails up, and we should. But, you know, we're entering an era in which, you know, governments were more or less hegemon when it came to, uh, you know, technologies, processes, units of people that could shift history, that, that is over. Um, it's in private hands, it's in garages, it's in universities, it's on servers. And, um, you know, that's just something we have to get used to. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely want to plus one that. I th yeah, I, th I think our ability and our courage to rethink institutions, it's going to, it, it has to happen because they were designed for quite a different era and um, expecting them to behave differently is, uh, yeah, foolhardy. I see there's a question about uh, disruption from Yakal. Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes just to explore. So past empires have often fallen with the arrival of new resource bases. Is there a way to avoid cultural collapse due to disruption? Any final parting 
quips for moments of zen. I worry a great deal about it, something that some people have termed reality collapse. Um, you know, if you'd asked me in the early days of the internet, where was the internet going to take us? I would have thought, although I wouldn't have had the vocabulary yet, be some combination of Wikipedia and Snopes. Um, just an incredible self-correcting, self-organizing hive mind that relentlessly seeks out truth. And untruth would have a very hard time surviving the onslaught of fact check checkers and the natural human desire not to be suckered or hoodwinked. Um, but instead, it's the natural human desire to always be right that seems to have won out. And, you know, many people have come to the point where they believe that they're entitled to their own facts, not just their own opinions. And reality collapse to me, it's a term that some people use in a differing set of ways, is um, whatever set of facts a certain group of people, whether they're fringe or mainstream, believe they're entitled to, the media could be synthesized the video, the audio, the news articles, the, you know, articles of, you know, by allegedly certain very well-branded publications can be synthesized to support that point of view, whatever it is. And that, you know, I, I don't know, cultural collapse, reality collapse, you know, Yakal's uh, question says cultural collapse. I don't know how we avoid this, but um, we better start thinking very hard about how to do it. Thanks, Rob. I'm just conscious of time. I know we've got a hard stop for a couple of people, including our panel on the hour. So I just want to say a huge thanks to Sam, Rob, and John, and particularly Chris for moderating as well. It's been a great conversation. And you can find the recording. It will be on the website. And we've got one more part coming up to the series on the 11th of July. We will have three more fellows um, just furthering the discussion, and Chris will be moderating again. So hopefully... The team will see you there on the 11th of July. But thank you, Kaikete, and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Chris.